I'm glad you actually said it that people are actually fighting for fame and for names. Yeah. Is, do you, my question basically is just to say, is, will it be sustainable? Because look at what happened to Tswane, what happened to um, Eastern Cape, Nelson Mandela Bay. Now we are going on a national scale, and it's, I think it's projected that maybe the ruling party will. Will, 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 will maybe be at, uh, will, they won't get the two thirds majority. So, how will that work, uh, Mr. Mm-hmm. Zungula? For, uh, yeah. yeah, I think the yeah, coalitions, especially to local government mm. level, you find that they put ideology, mm. manifestos, policies on the side. Mm. They just want to club together for the sake of allocating positions of mm. power amongst each other. The best way, in our view, for coalitions to work is for parties to say, these are the fundamentals. This is a program of action to say, um, you know, transform the economy, stronger borders, um, transformation of the education system. Like we've got a program of action that is dealing with the problems. Mm. That should be the primary um, point of departure. And once now you've got these programs that you've mm. decided on, and then the secondary question then becomes, who is better suited for what particular role? Welcome to episode 22 of the Business Agenda podcast. For all first-time viewers, this podcast is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. As always, my name is Cash, also known as the Joburg Bachelor. I'm joined by my fellow co-hosts. We've got Nico, Miza, Tumeleng, Mano underscore T, commonly known as Tabo. And as always, I'd like to thank and acknowledge all the people who make the podcast happen in the background. Thank you to Tsepo. Our videographer, if you want to see more on that gentleman, just check out who is Tsepo on Instagram. Today we have an esteemed guest and uh, great timing as we lead up to elections. I know some of you thought as a business podcast we will not touch and get into such subjects, but you know, look, it's part of the business landscape, you know, economics, how things are going. And we discussed top of the year on our first episode what the year is going to look like, and we obviously touched on the elections and voter registration. But as always, before we get into the episode and our guest, I just want to do a quick check, see how you guys are doing, and then we'll get into it. So how have you guys been keeping since the two long weekends? We had a wedding, you know, uh, those of you who saw on socials, one of our co-hosts was doing the things. Ali, li, 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 li. <laughs> <laughs> but how are you guys doing? How's it been, you know, since the long weekends work, you know, since the first episode, how are you guys keeping? Uh, I mean, I think it's good to be back. Happily yeah. married. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think um, one of the questions people ask me, like, hey, why don't you go straight to honeymoon? But I had to jump straight into month, and uh, I think I'll see that uh, maybe next month. Yeah. But otherwise, pretty much good presentations. Like today, we had one as well. Of course, elections. Investors want to know, like, hey, is everything priced in? What's going on? What's going to happen? I think a lot of, for the first time, I think people are excited. And uh, we are no longer scared anymore. Yeah. But uh, anyway, it's all good. All good on my side, yeah. Good. Nico, on your end? Yeah, all good. All good as well. Uh, I've been busy attending weddings left, right, and center. <laughs> <laughs> but besides that, all good. And, uh, nappy brides, Kenny behind Nappy it. <laughs> it's, it's been busy. <laughs> it, 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 yeah. it gets pricey. No, that's fine. I think we can just jump straight into it. So our guest, for those of you who don't know, based on his lovely branded uh, attire, is Mr. Vuyo Zungula, the leader and uh, party president for the African Transformation Movement. Uh, thank you, firstly, so for joining us. We appreciate you taking your time. And I think just to get straight into it, obviously, maybe you can just start by giving us your background, your how you got into politics, and ultimately how your party was formed would be a good place to start. Yeah, uh, yeah. thank you for the opportunity. I think it's always good to have such conversations that lead to people actually being informed about the affairs of their own country. So how I got into politics, there was a council of Messianic churches um, which got together and said... We've been voting for the ruling party, but when it comes to the governance issues, we're not involved in terms of shaping government policy. So we need to have our own voice. And that voice, um, they said, let's form our own party that will represent the aspirations of this um, particular grouping. Now, when that was done, as there's a lot of royal houses, ordinary citizens who said, we don't want another church party. We want a party that will represent everyone. So that is why you find that our um, views are not 
um, you know, representing a particular group of society, but it's representative of everyone. Um, I was fortunate to be to have been given the representative of everyone. Um, I was fortunate to be to have been given the given an additional responsibility of leading the party. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, it, that's an interesting take. That it sounds like they asked you to do the administrative part of setting up the party, and then while you're doing that, how about you just become the leader of the party? Yeah, <laughs> I think it's it's a case whereby they saw the potential mm-hmm. and asked themselves, okay. Why should we invest ourselves in getting another person, whereas we've got someone who's doing the work um, in a good way? So I think that's how, I think that's what motivated them to say, rather continue, because I think they took a risk, um, but at the same time it shows how much they are invested in young people, because I think I was 30 at the time, Mm -hmm. no political experience, I was never a member of any political party, but with what... I showed in terms of um, being able to understand what is wrong in the country, how could it be fixed, and how we can get people to be involved. I think they said this is the type of politician we want because, again, some of the political parties, you find that they are coming, they are saying they are new parties, but you find they come with the older way of approaching politics, which takes away the freshness and the unique um, approach they need to have in politics. And just the, uh, out of interest, uh, were you ever active in politics like in varsity? You know how people sort of pivot into politics from student. your student movements mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Were you ever involved prior to, um, prior to this? Nope, I was not involved. Um, I actually was approached by um, Basma. Is it Bas? I know Azasco. Yeah, Azasco in university. They wanted me to be the presidential candidate for the SRC elections. At the time, I was the leader of a Christian organization. And when we spoke to the leadership, they said, I can't do both because when people are seeing me on campus, they're seeing the student Christian organization, which is TASA, I represent. Now, if I'm going to come wearing another cap, it's going to cause confusion. Mm -hmm. So they said, look, focus on the role that you've been given um, and um, don't be formally involved in politics because I did assist Azasco when he came to um, campaigning, getting people um, to vote and taking the organization seriously. But for me, being the face and the presidential candidate of the, part, of the student um, um, party, I could not have done it. So, <coughs> so Mr. Zumbula, like, uh, like you said, you didn't have any experience and uh, your party, as I saw, it's mainly... Youth base. So now, how do we encourage the youth to vote? Because the last time we saw the youth was uh, sort of uh, um, they didn't want to vote. How do we get the youth uh, interested? Because I think uh, with your numbers, you managed to you managed to I think get two national seats, yeah, and then one in Eastern Cape, one in KZN. Mm-hmm. So now, how do we how do we do that on a larger scale to get the youth actively involved? Uh, yeah, I think the problem when it comes to the politics of our country in line with the education system um, and the social structure of our country. Generally, many people are ignorant when it comes to politics. It becomes also deliberate because if you had a government that realized, okay, here's a problem of ignorance, especially amongst young people, let's use education system um, life orientation is a subject to teach people about patriotism, being involved in their affairs in an apolitical manner. So for us, I think what the government should have done, because the government does have the capabilities, um, you find that a lot of people did not even know they need to register to vote. They don't know the options they have, but what they know is that they are not going to vote. Yet they are the very same young people that are going to complain about unemployment, you know, not having, you know, funding for varsity and stuff, but they are not involved in shaping their own future. So for us, I think we just need to keep on having conversations that are going to empower young people. I know other parties want to have parties, other political organizations want to have parties and bashes because most, more, more likely, you are more likely to get young mm. people a club being than you would get them, for example, listening to such engagements. So there's many things that could be done, but I think it falls upon the people that understand and know the importance of being politically um, active to spread on the message to the ignorant ones who think they should not be part of political life. And yeah, so because I've always I've always been curious, right? Um, one can go on a marketing campaign in corporate where 
you introduce a new cool drink or you introduce and or, or a new alcohol we've seen that where guys really go on massive campaigns but when it comes to things like um uh, election uh, sorry um uh, voter registration weeks and stuff yes it's here uh, here and there where you hear about these things but uh, the e- the amount of effort that gets put in does does it rely is it supposed to be national government or is it supposed to be like an I um, uh, IEC who puts in that kind of effort to to say who actually does come in uh, uh, who whose responsibility is it basically um, to 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 like push the marketing and why would they not then uh, so, so uh, uh, market b- before you answer Mr Zungula like I don't know maybe I'm, I stand to be corrected uh, is, is it true that uh, there is allocation to IEC and why isn't uh, to add on to Nico's question why isn't IEC doing more because like I had the same conversation with my colleagues today that there's so <coughs> many different parties but people only know about the three yeah you know yeah <coughs> maybe just I just wanted to to if you can clarify the yeah allocation yeah. and yeah no, the responsibility of doing voter education lies with the mm. IEC. Mm. And with voter education, it's the, um, the electoral board, which is IEC, educating people about the importance of voting. How do you vote? Um, you know, dealing with the stigmas associated with voting. There are people, especially in the villages, who are uh, made to believe if they vote differently from the ruling party, they are going to lose out on their pensions, or grants, or you know, all of the social assistance from the government. So the IEC is there to counter that and make sure that we've got a voter, uh, we've got a population that is educated when it comes to voting. There's money that has been allocated. To recall in the budget speech, the Minister of Finance had, um, allocated additional resources to the IEC because of elections. So it is there. However, we are of the view now politically that. A well-informed electorate when it comes to voting does not suit the ruling party because the ruling party thrives on ignorance in the sense that if people are not voting, um, um, it means, um, remember in 2021, the ruling party lost some of the municipalities as well as 2016 and they retained some of the municipalities precisely because people did not go out and vote for other parties. They just remained at home and did not vote. Mm. So once you've got a lower voter turnout, that is of benefit to the ruling party in the sense that when a person is so disillusioned about the state of the country, you as a ruling party would rather have that person stay at home and not vote instead of going out and voting differently. And then the second thing again speaks to the, the ignorance whereby because these people who are not voting are people who would most likely vote differently. Mm. And when they vote differently, it's when the ruling party loses its support. So at a broader political point of view, it is something that is done deliberately by the ruling party because the ruling party has got influence in the judiciary, in the IEC, mm. Chapter 9 institutions. Mm. So the influence is not only in parliament whereby they've got formal members of the ruling party, but in most all state institutions, they, you, they do have members that are loyal to the ruling party and they are going to use their positions in whatever institutions in favor of the ruling party. So that is the crux of the problem that we face, Uguba. The IEC, and the other issue with the IEC is that most of the voter education programs are in the white minority um, areas or urban areas. Mm. You'll find that a person that is, um, for example, living in an affluent area will be informed about voting as compared to someone living in the villages. Mm. Now, that is why you find there's a higher turnout um, near voter at a, at an, in these affluent areas, lower turnout in, the, um, um, in these areas, townships and the villages. So that is where the disparities lie, whereby the IEC, instead of investing in the townships and the um, villages whereby voter education is most needed, they would rather focus on the affluent areas because in the affluent areas, a person is most likely to vote for the Democratic Alliance or uh, many of these liberal parties. Again, you've got NGOs that are given money by some of these state institutions to actually do voter education. But again, that voter education is tilted towards these affluent areas instead of the poor areas whereby generally that is where people are most um, you know, ignorant or unaware about the affairs of the country. You spoke about uh, disenfranchisement of people in terms of voters where they feel 
this, the choices that are there do not serve them, so they rather stay at home, which obviously serves the ruling party. I, I think one thing that's been going around a lot in terms of just social discourse is people feel there are too many political parties. I, I wanted to get at a high level. Firstly, what's your thought on that? Mm. And secondly, as a fairly new political party, do you feel South Africa has an overload of political parties? Because you find outside of South Africa and in other countries, Democrats, Republicans, mm. Tories versus the Labour Party, and maybe in other cases, maybe one other. Because what that does is it it creates a situation where people know exactly what they're getting. But if you look even at the ballot, it's, I know sometimes people talk about it jokingly, there's so many choices. I think in a way that leads to a bit of a disenfranchisement and where people stay at home. But so just high level, maybe start with what are your thoughts as a new, fairly new political party? Do you think South Africa has too many parties? Yeah, South Africa, there is too many parties. Um, Precisely because some people in the political space are there for their own, you know, yes. gratification. Because you find, for example, now you are going to have parties that were not that could not meet the IEC threshold. Now, if these people were about the betterment of society, the most natural thing you would expect them to do is to say, the IEC requirements we could not meet them. We are not going to win the ballot. However, we are endorsing this particular party because it is sharing the same view as us. But you find that majority of the parties who could not make the IC threshold will just sit down and they will not make any pronouncement to say this is where we encourage our supporters to actually go and vote. So that is the biggest issue because many people in the political space are not there for the benefit of society. That is why you find in Parliament, it was a shock of my life when I went there because my expectation was that it's going to be an institution whereby there's festival of ideas, solutions, and would rather fight over ideas instead of personalities. Mm -hmm. And what I experienced there is that indeed, instead of that, people are fighting over um, fame, they're fighting over power, they're mm -hmm. fighting mm -hmm. over the, the relevance. And patronage. Um, mm -hmm. And patronage. Instead of, um, let's have a a conflict of ideas, because once we've got a conflict of ideas, basically we focus our debates on what are the solutions to the problems. But immediately we fight over personalities. Then it's less about the people and more about the, the, the players in parliament. So, but I think as time goes on, we hope that people will come back to their senses and say, let's work for the betterment of society, because if we don't do that, South Africa is a ticking time bomb. South Africa is, you know, is, uh, you know, is heading the direction of being a failed state. And if we don't find ways of working together as a parties, we are not going to address that. That is why, as the ATM, we are not a party that is anti so and so. You'll see that we go to different parties, manifestos, because we believe that when we operate as parties, we operate at this level, which is we are self-centered as a parties. But once we get to work together on many issues, then we are able to solve the issues that are, um, you know, that are needed to be solved for the betterment of society. We'll recall in the former President Zuma years, what made the parliament to be able to deal with the Nkantla issue, it was not a singular party, but it was different parties clapping together. Similarly, on Palapala, it was not a singular party, but it was different parties saying we're going to work together. So that shows that when parties actually put their differences aside, work on the common interests of the country who are most likely to solve our problems. I just, <clears throat> I just wanted to, uh, to, just to bring you back again on that. Uh, what, is, what, is, what is your view on, on, on coordination? Because we can see uh, uh, on social media you're being pushed to, to co-align with a certain party, the red one, whereas your values are different compared to them. And then number two, uh, we saw what coalitions actually did, I'm glad you actually said it, that people are actually fight him for fame and for names. Yeah. Is, do you, my question basically is just to say, is, will it be sustainable? Because look at what happened to Tswane. Mm -hmm. What happened to um, Eastern Cape, Nelson Mandela Bay. Now we are going on a national scale. And it's, I think it's projected that maybe the ruling part will, 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 will maybe be at, uh, will, they won't get the two-thirds majority. Mm -hmm. So how will that work, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Zungula? For, yeah. yeah, I think the yeah, coalitions, especially to local government mm. level, you find that they put ideology, manifestos, mm. policies on the side. Mm. They just want to club together for the sake of allocating positions of mm. power amongst each other. The best way in our view for coalitions to work, it's for parties to say, 
these are the fundamentals. This is a program of action to say, um, you know, transform the economy, stronger borders, um, transformation of the education system. Like we've got a program of action that is dealing with the problems. Mm. That should be the primary um, point of departure. And once now you've got these programs that you've decided on, and then the secondary question then becomes, who is better suited for what particular role? For example, if a person were to look at, um, let's say we want to transform the SME sector to have a bigger stake in the economy, and then we look at the manifestos to say, okay, we agree on the importance of the SMMEs, and um, a certain party um, covers this issue of SMMEs much better than all of these parties. Therefore, this particular department must be led by this party because of what they've done in the manifesto or their articulation, because parties are strong in different, um, in different areas. Mm. So once you have an approach that is program first, and then you come back and say, who does what? And who does what is not based on wanting to just, um, you know, selfishly satisfy people, but it's based on the strength of the parties, then it becomes much easier to have coalitions. Unfortunately, now you've got parties that ideologically, they are so opposed, but you find that they are talking about wanting to have a coalition. For example, DA um, has been saying they are wanting to have a coalition with the ANC to avoid a coalition of the ANC and other parties. Mm. And you find that policy-wise, the, DM, the ANC, in terms of its resolutions, speaks about land expropriation, state bank, building state capacity. DA, on the other side, is more on the public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, what do they call it? The free market economy. You know, so you find, yeah, and they are against BE. Mm -hmm. ANC, this side, you they know, are BE. they are for BE. Mm -hmm. So you find that from a policy point of view, it will become chaos. But if you've got parties that are like-minded ideologically and policy-wise, then you are easily going to find means and ways to work together. It seems to me that it's more of a power play, you know, where people don't take your uh, logical approach and guys uh, focus a lot more on on, on uh, how much power will I gather it's if I join uh, with this person and this mm -hmm. person. And I, I wanted to go back to the point um, uh, you mentioned um, about uh, parliament, right? Um, I was reading something interesting recently about um, how uh, an ordinary South African doesn't really know what the purpose of parliament is and who actually goes to parliament over the last few weeks we've seen the names come forward of um you know the people nominated to go to parliament etc but then i just want to ask you to maybe give a brief explanation of what like um what's the what's the purpose of parliament who are those people why are they there who do they represent etc because that's uh, i think one of the things that i when i read it some of the stuff i must be honest i also i wasn't aware that that's exactly you know the the, the roles and responsibilities that exist so parliament has got two functions one is lawmaking the other is oversight so on the lawmaking side it's when um you know let's say there's a bill um that is introduced by any member of parliament or maybe there's a, a, a department, government department that is saying, okay, we are working in this space and we think this bill or the laws need to be changed to, for us as a department to achieve a certain um, objective. So the first part of parliament is the one that is parliament is there to make laws, laws that are implemented by the executive and interpreted by the judiciary, whether they are implementing those laws in line with what um, the, 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 in line with the, the constitution and the laws as, as drafted by parliament. And then the other side of parliament, the role now becomes the oversight and accountability mechanism whereby parliament plays an oversight role over the executive. That is why you find that how parliament is structured, if there's 34 ministers, which is 34 departments, employment and labor, home affairs, and all of these um, departments, there's a corresponding portfolio committee whereby the home affairs minister and the departments accounts to the portfolio committee. So everything that has been done by this department will be scrutinized by this um, particular portfolio committee. Now, what that does is that um, it is giving now parliament an obligation to check whether this department is doing things in accordance to the law and in, lie in, um, in the best interest of the people. Now, the people that are in parliament, the issue becomes the loyalty. 
Because when people vote, put aside now these elections whereby you vote for independent candidates. When people vote, they vote for a party, they don't vote for an individual. Now, when a member of parliament is sworn in, they, are, they take an oath to be loyal to the country. Now, it requires that sometimes, Zukoba, they need to be loyal to the country to the detriment of their own um, party. on their own party. You'll recall in the previous um, presidential term, this question of voting with your conscience, um, secret ballot, yes. came out quite a lot because it required now members of parliament to vote against the instructions or the wishes of their own party. So that is the biggest issue now that is facing members of parliament to say, if you're a member of parliament, who exactly are you representing? Are you representing the citizens or are you representing the party? Many parties are of the view that it is a party that got to be voted there. People were not voting for Vuyo, they were voting for a party, and they were voting for a party based on the manifesto of the party. So Uvuyo is in parliament to implement the views of the party. And then there's this other uh, argument to say, but when Vuyo was sewn in, the party was not sewn in. Um, it was Vuyo that was sewn in as an individual, and he sought to be faithful and loyal to the country, even if, if it means to, de um, to the detriment of his own party. So I think that is where the conflict lies. So the question of a secret ballot when it comes to voting, it becomes also very important because there are times whereby members of the ruling party um, you know, they do want to vote with the opposition, but they can't openly vote because they are going to be punished by their own ruling party. So the issue of the secret ballot then enables, that is why when we went to court, we said a secret ballot actually enables parliament to play a more effective oversight role because when you are making a choice as a member of parliament, you are not having the consideration, Ukoba, this is how my party is going to punish me, um, I'm going to be kicked out from parliament. And remember, majority of members of parliament um, if a person was in politics since age 18, they don't know any other life besides politics. So they would not want um, to tamper with their bread. So it compromises then their, their role in terms of holding the executive accountable. So that is the crux of the issue when it comes to how parliament ought to operate. That is why, Tina, we said um, there needs to be a change in terms of their roles because the constitution of our country is saying when you elect a president... The voting mechanism is a secret ballot. But if you are going to hold the president accountable, meaning by a motion of no confidence, it is the speaker that decides the voting mechanism. So, you know, I was saying, but, but you can't, when you put in a person, secret ballot, when you have to remove him, not um, a secret ballot anymore. So that is where we got it wrong in terms of our constitution. So I wanted to ask, maybe just to bring you back to your political party and your background, because I think why some people have little, as citizens, have little interest in political parties, nine times out of ten when they listen to politicians, regardless of the party, they get plenty of promises. Yeah. And I think we all know how that tends to go. Same promises, person disappears, comes back after five years. And that leads to a situation where even the youth are not interested in politics, but it's the only way to fix the country. So uh, in terms of just putting on the spot a little bit, what sets your party apart? Maybe at the core, what are the main values of the ATM and what do you plan to do different? If someone says, okay, I've watched this and I like what they're saying, but to get behind you, what really sets your part values-wise and what's different for ATM and any other political party? Well, when it comes to um, being trustworthy and dependable to the people, when ATM was campaigning in 2019, we had our manifesto, because that is a promise, a manifesto. Mm -hmm. When we go to parliament, since um, day one, which is the sauna of June 2019, up until now, we've been very vocal and consistent on what we had promised. The issue is that because people are sometimes unaware of um, you know, our governance structures, they would think that if we're promising um, that SMMEs are going to have a more dominant role in the economy, when we get into parliament, we have the power to do that. 
not understanding that when we're making those promises, we're saying that if we become a ruling party, we are going to be this. But once we are elected and we become an opposition party, then our role is limited to influencing the ruling party because we are not in power to make the decisions. But when it comes to the consistency, um, you can now hold the party accountable to say, you promised um, that you are going to prioritize SMMEs. Now let's hear your debates on SONA. Um, debates on dealing with youth unemployment, dealing with unemployment, restructuring of the economy. If the SMM is, is a dominant theme, then it means you have lived up to your promise. So if people could um, hold us accountable based on what we say in parliament, advocating for the very same issue we're advocating for whilst we were campaigning. And the other thing is that it is difficult for us to you see now we're campaigning yeah. almost every day we have to go to a community but once elections come i can't go to the community like we're going now because now i'm a member of parliament um i need to be more in parliament representing the communities so the interaction levels are higher when it comes to interacting with communities during the election season to get a mandate but once you get a mandate you can't go to the community left right and center you should be in parliament speaking to the powers that be about what you were promising the people and influencing the, the, the members, uh, sorry, the members of the executive when it comes to what is in the best interest of the people. Now, that is what, um, if a person were to read our 2019 manifesto, observe how we have consistently remained um, consistent on the issues and the advocacy. Um, with no doubt, ATM has been consistent. So what we aim to do differently, Tina, is the ATM, critically so, is the issue of um, tr staying true to the people. Because if you're funded by wealthy corporates, if you are to be funded, for example, by beneficiaries of the current economic structure, it is highly unlikely that you would advocate for um, the transformation of the economy. Because the bottom line is, the Oppenheimers, the Rupers, and everyone that is benefiting from the current economic structure does not want it to be transformed because any transformation of, of the economy is going to tamper with the bottom line. So many parties, unfortunately, in our country are funded by the very same beneficiaries of the current structure of the economy. That is why they advocate for cosmetic changes um, into the economy. Whereas if you're looking at how econ the economy is structured, the economy, a lot of people say it's transformed. But since 1994, there was a government, Yabanda mm. Bamiyama. It has not changed in terms of the structure. You still have very few companies that are dominant in terms of the economy. That is why I can, I, I can, I can assure you any industry in our country, telecom telecommunications industry, you can count, you won't reach seven companies that are having more than 90% of the market share in that sector. Go to the banking, go to construction, almost all industries, you won't reach seven companies. Now, that is where Tina was saying as an ATM, in order to change our country so that you don't have the highest unemployment rates, poverty rates, and the highest inequality. You need to transform the economy. Transformation of the economy, in our view, means you need to change government spending to be more towards SMMEs. And the benefit of SMMEs, if you were to do comparison with other growing economies whereby there's low unemployment, their economies are largely based on SMMEs. Germany is largely based on mm. SMMEs and cooperatives. So that is why you find that it is a thriving economy. But in our country, you find that government spending, 80% of government spending goes towards big business. And government is having a budget of over 2.5 trillion. All of that 2.5 trillion goes to big business. 20% goes to SMMEs. And in according to the NDP, now, um, the NDP says the government um, or the country will have 90% of the jobs from SMMEs. But check this disparity. They say 90% of the jobs from SMMEs, mm. but in terms of government spending, SMMEs are only allocated 20%, which does not make yeah. sense. So, so if I may ask, I mean, how come, how come then black people and the black votes and the black parties don't unite for that exact mm, reason. Exactly. Because I'm be thinking he, uh, him and Minister Lindwe Zulu should be like this. Because mm. yeah. I was going to ask, I mean, how, 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 how should we, 
Because you see, the biggest problem black people have is inequality. Yeah. And this is irrespective of which, you know, um, sort of um, party you vote for because the inequality is there. And I think everybody's trying to solve for that in some shape or form. Um, how come there isn't um, a mechanism where the black parties can talk to each other, mm -hmm. even outside elections, just to actually figure out how can we all work together? We can all be different but we actually need to be addressing, like what you're saying, we're being funded by the same people. The agenda is clear from, from, the, from the, 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 the people that benefit from status quo. And what can, what can the black hands do or black leaders do to actually, you know, to actually work towards that? Because I, I think, I think it's, it's, it's obviously going to be difficult to do it as, as one party. It's, it requires everybody. And, and how come the parties can't work together? You know how sometimes when you see things like funerals, you'll see everybody put politics aside yeah. and stand there to, to pay respects. Um, when you see things like sports, we'll put you know, politics aside and united uh, at the back of the country. But I think inequality, it might be one of those that we also need to actually put politics aside and then unite for the black people because, like you were saying, it's, it will most likely be a a failed state if we don't unite. Yeah. You, know? you know, our politics, unfortunately, they are centered around sensationalism, spectacle. Hence, you find that I can go to parliament, debate on SONA, whereby it's all issues, solutions, mm. ideas, but my speech will never trend. But someone there is going to go there and speak about, what did he speak about? I've got you by, you know. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so you find that. And, and that's going to trend. That's yeah. going to a trend. Or someone goes yeah, on, goes yeah. problem and goes hong, hong, hong. Yeah. Exactly. And it's, we mm. still have that. <laughs> but in addition to that, sorry to cut it, I just, I feel strongly about this because my, like my co says, why is it that we, in Africa, we've seen that the further you go from independence of each country, the more it comes towards a failed state. Mm. So South Africa being a country that gained independence in the latter stages in terms of uh, getting independence, there's plenty of blueprints on how not to end up there. But faster than we'd want, South Africa is ending up in that direction. Do you honestly envision a situation, because the main challenge, is all, as we're all agreeing, is human greed yeah. and more self-interest. Where is that nationalism that came together to end apartheid? Yeah. That's the same same level of black consciousness that's required. That look at some levels we can have our squabbles, but ultimately at the rate the country's going, mm. unemployment, uh, the country's been actually sold. If you think of it in terms of there's no business hubs, if it's not China, it's elsewhere, mm. and we've lost industries like in the Eastern Cape, the the sewing and the fabric industries was lost to overseas, mm. uh, other countries. So why is it now? Yes, we understand people are self entitled. That's always been the nature of politics. Why can we not get back to that level of nationalism or just mm. the black movement even at some levels have your squabbles but focus on the main agenda? Yeah. You know, I think for that, black people have been defocused on their real issues for, um, for the past 30 years. And I think they've also internalized that being defocused to an extent whereby even if you try to have relations with other parties, People are so used to differences, they're so used to that we need to be enemies because we are in different parties. I went to a manifesto launch of the EFF. On social media the following week, I took flag. People are coming to at me, you know, mm. but what are you doing there? I went a following week later to um, PAC again. What are you doing there? You know, because in their minds... We need to, you know, be, be in divided. separate lanes, be yeah. divided. So it's taking a bit of time, people, to understand our vision as the ATM to say it must, it must not be about the parties. It must be about the people. And the best way to do that is that we need to interact with the parties because for us to find each other on issues, we need to have space whereby we can sit, um, you know, talk about issues, you know, discuss issues, so that when we go to parliament and we advocate these issues, we have discussed behind the scenes about how you know we can work together in service to the country. But the problem is that it is taking some time because of how people have been defocused on the politics of issues. They are now on the politics of um, loyalty to parties, politics of sensation, instead of loyalty to um, like the, 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 the movement of saying this is what we want to achieve. And I want to agree with you to say, you know, pre-1994, every black person in our country 
we're saving we're saving that thought that we're fighting for freedom one common and goal. this is what freedom means one man one vote um equal country blah 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 all of those issues but after 1994 i don't think people were galvanized to say this now becomes our generational mission to say how then do we live in a more equal society how then do we change the ownership of the land how then do we transform the economy how then do we make south africans to live a better life so people have not been galvanized around the broader objectives they've been galvanized around personalities and political parties that is why you're going to have a person loyal to the party even if the party is messing up loyal to an individual even if the individual is misleading them but if a person or the country was you know um, mobilized on the goal or the, the 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 objectives of improving the lives of the people if who your messes up they were going to hold me accountable not to be loyal to me but you've got people in our politics or in our country that are loyal to other parties or individual to the detriment of the um, greater goals of abanda bamnyama but if you look at the white minority they are, they built a university in centurion mm-hmm. um, you know they are always step ahead of us because and you find that i made was making this example i never i've never seen a breakaway of a freedom front plus i've never seen members of the freedom front plus you know banning a t-shirt of mm. one leader of another or mm. another simply because maybe they are able to look at the bigger goal whereas tina is about us if it's not me then i'm going to sit down and i'm not going to campaign because precisely maybe i'm in politics for my own self enrichment not in politics for the betterment of society so what we're trying to answer is the atm that is why we go to different parties rallies we engage different parties there's a new party that reached out to us and said look um you actually inspire us because you got into parliament without any experience in politics but you've made your mark how did you do it and we had a two hour engagement even now today i got an invite to their manifesto rally of which i'm going to go simply because i strongly believe that we need we need now after 30 years of democracy we need um parties to work together um you know in to seek to achieve the greater goals of the greater society instead of what we saw that has in work which is people that are loyal to parties or individuals so so basically what you're saying mr zungula is that parties being partisan is not an issue yeah. it's just that when we get to parliament or when we get to those uh, three subcommittee portfolio committees that you are in we should focus on 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 the end goal yeah. so 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 maybe before i bring in nico how do we how do you align with uh, let's say you and the ruling party mm-hmm. you've said such great ideas now on smmes and stuff so like how do you align your your end goal with them and to say uh, uh, whoever is in that portfolio community how do they remove themselves from being partisan to say look uh, voy is saying such a lo- voy and atm are saying such a lo- uh, 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 valid valid points yeah. let's 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 invest more in the sme smmes and let's forget uh, big corporations yeah. so how do how, how does how does that uh, how does that work uh, in terms of uh, yeah if i can make an example i'm part of a minerals and yeah. energy um, portfolio committee mm. in that portfolio committee we made it clear and fortunately the chairperson of the committee was someone who said look when you are here yes we are representing different parties but what is important is that let's raise issues in the betterment of society therefore let us not be so much into our own parties and forget to go back. all of us as members of parliament we took on oath um, you know to put the interests of the people first so whenever there's discussions debates i remember one time there was this talk about um, um moving away to um um good and not just just transition just yeah. energy transition yes and all of us there in the committee except of course the DA we're saying that it should not be we should st- we should stick to clean coal technologies because we have coal in abundance in our country we've got coal power stations we can't just now move from coal to renewables yabo yeah, um, especially because we've got so many towns in pumalanga 
their entire economy is dependent on those coal coal mines. So when a person was listening to our engagement, they could not tell who's coming from which part because mm. all of us were speaking in one voice on that. Similarly, I'm also a member of small business development. We were raising this thing of saying um, there needs to be harsh punishment for departments who take more than 60 days to pay invoices. Because as a small business, you don't have the luxury of waiting 90, 120 days for your invoices mm. to be paid. And we need to do away with red tape. We need to advocate for government to increase its spending on SMMEs. Yeah, well. mm. So I think what helps in our view is that we are not pompous mm. and we are able now to you know, focus people on their ideas and if the ruling party wants to, um, you know, um, go to and don't take over the ideas, if it's theirs, we don't mind, you know, as long as the it's ideas will be implemented, implemented. Yeah. and Amanda are going to benefit. Whereas other parties are like, this is our thing, and we don't want the ruling party to take it as theirs, of which you can't stop that. If it's going to benefit the people, we don't care, you know, as long as the people are going to benefit. So it's no. about being patriotic. Yeah, putting the interests of the people first instead mm -hmm. of wanting to cement yourself to say, you did that, you did that, because it does not help the people. Okoba, I get the credit. Mm -hmm. um, but what helps the people is that the government is actually implementing this and people's lives are going to change for the better. Yeah. No, firstly, I want to uh, commend you and tell you that you must keep fighting for us and for yeah. our small businesses. <laughs> <laughs> as a um, small business as owner. a small business owner, it's really very difficult to you know to navigate uh, um, uh, and 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 compete against these big guys, particularly because of the um, the financial muscle that they have and the f and the difficulties we have in terms of you know getting getting funding and things like that. And um, but um, the, the question I have is also on the funding side, right? Um, you did mention uh, uh, a political funding. I was having a conversation with someone, and my view is really that um, depending on who funds you, there could be a potential uh, uh, conflict of interest in uh, in that, uh, you know, your, your manifesto is kind of swayed in a certain direction, uh, even though the individual does not necessarily tell you that that is the case. But, um, and, and so what I just wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, on, on political fundings and uh, uh, if you believe that there should be some sort of caps in, introduced and things like that. Yeah, you know, Thomas Sankara put it very, very clear by saying whoever funds you controls you. Mm -hmm. Like what you, like think about the genocide in Palestine. Think about the parties that were saying, but no, there's no genocide, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. And once you look at those parties' financials or the declarations to the IEC, you can see who is giving the money. Mm -hmm. That is why they're able to turn a blind eye on a genocide, clear genocide that everyone knows that people of Palestine are being wiped out of their own land. But because these people need to be loyal to whoever gives them money. So that is the, 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 the problem in our country in the sense that you don't have independent parties or independent members of parliament. You've got proxies or representatives of whoever that is funding them. So that is why Tina is an ATM. We were funded by our members. That is why if you check the posters, you are most likely to see these big parties. Parties receive millions and millions. Mm. But the question that we ask ourselves, fine, let's say we get this money from these big guys. But at what cost? Mm. The cost that comes with it is that you are no longer going to be a representative of the people. You are going to be a representative of whoever that gives you money. And Tina, you know, we said, but we can't be a representative of whoever gives us money, which is now the big corporates, foreign agents and um, other companies. Because the discord between, that's why many people are so disillusioned with voting. Because many parties, they'll go to communities, make so many promises. Mm. But when Parties are elected. It is the funders that actually dictate to parties what needs to be done. So then people are like, but we voted. And you promised one, two, three. But when you are now in government, you are doing something else. Like a practical example, if you are funded by businessmen that is into the building of RDP houses, or maybe building of Kutu and Donlan taxi ranks, you find that there's so many municipalities that have built taxi ranks, which are not being used mm. because the government in that municipality needs to pay back their funder by building a taxi rank 
But this taxi rank is not going to benefit the people. It's not needed by the people. Maybe people needed something else. But because these guys needed to pay back their funder, they need now to create this or build this taxi rank. I was um, in Fulain well, the other yeah. time. There's a taxi rank there that's not being utilized. Similarly, uh, Mokale City, there's a sim similar problem. So, and I picked up no men across the municipalities. There's so many taxi ranks. And I can assure you, there is no way the government or municipality level would not know, Koba, these are the existing taxi ranks. So let's refurbish those. Or these are the areas whereby the taxi ranks could be built. But because these guys, and remember there's a need. Um, if, there's a, if, if a person now needs to pay back their funder, they need to give government contracts in line with the businesses of that funder, even if it means you ignore what people really need. So it's, it's a big issue, and I hope when people are voting, they need to do their research and check, okay, who is bankrolling this party and at what cost? Mm. Because when you vote, I want to stress this point, when you vote, you're not voting for a party or the leader or its manifesto, but to a great degree, you are voting for the interest of whoever that is funding that party. I, I, I'm from the Val, I can attest. <laughs> we yeah. have a lot of text mm. that are not useful. So I guess that's the reason why there was a big fight about parties showing who, who actually f is funding them. Mm. Yeah. But I also wanted to I also wanted to to to, to get your view on uh, the tender system, the yeah. one that you just explained now. Mm. Like why is that system so problematic? Problematic and it's not transparent. Ex especially that. Like now Somebody funded the party. Yeah. That person gets a tender. So how how do we regu how do we regulate the tender system? Because for me, I think in the last episode that we had, I had a mini uh, um, tirade, <laughs> ti maybe tantrum because of the tender system in South Africa that's not transparent. How do we fix it? Can't we? For me, maybe if, if I'll take this as a as a, as, a, as an opportunity to to get an education, like. Can't we get uh, a certain department to say, okay, fine, if a certain department is going to, uh, uh, let's say Department of Transport or Public Works, mm -hmm. like, can't they do the roads or assign the municipal? Why do we need a tender system that's not transparent? Because I think that's where we're wasting money. I, I don't know, maybe I'll, 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 I'd like to get your opinion on that, yeah. Yeah, I think tenders or gov the, the concept of government contracts, it is a, um, a system that we can't run away from. It's a system mm. that is necessary because you need state intervention. Um, if you check how the economy under white rule was able to, um, to be transformed, mm. you saw, see companies like Abo Sandlam and the mm. others, they were actually built, um, even some of the state institutions, they were actually built at the back of government contracts. Mm -hmm. Now, the question or the biggest issue is having a band to, that are presiding over the affairs of the country, but who do not work, who are not acting in the best interests of the people. So that is where the issue is. Not to say the system is wrong. Okay. The system is right, but the people who are presiding over the system are the wrong one, are the wrong one because mm. they are selfish. That is why you find that even if a tenant is advertised, they already know who's going to get it. And yeah. um, mm. they sit down. Um, you know, some of the, if you look at the Eastern Cape, so much money is returned back to National Treasury. Let's say it's... Uh, Unallocated. Um, uh, yeah. And you find that, for example, it's about money belonging to the Department of Education. There's a need because there's so many schools that need to be upgraded, mm. infrastructure, etc. But because they fight over who gets to um, have this tender, they would rather say, we're not going to issue the tender. Anyway, let it rather go back to National Treasury. And the people end up losing. So That's in our view you need a bundle that will place the interest of the people ahead of their own. I mean, in terms of your principles, I th uh, one thing I saw in just doing high-level research, you've got some quite, I don't want to say radical, but firm principles in terms of stuff like the death penalty. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking maybe a two-folded question. South Africa's constitution is quite inclusive. I know you mentioned that you're a Masonic Christian party that is all-inclusive. But one, do you, how possible do you think it is for the ATM to be a party that can represent the people from an inclusive standpoint. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. And secondly, do you feel South Africa has the leadership outside of your party? Does South Africa have the leadership to make the bold decisions? Because bold decisions do need to be made around crime, mm -hmm. around corruption, around GBV. Mm -hmm. Almost a Margaret Thatcher type personality who came in and just said, 
the unions, the power they had, she dealt with that. Mm. But now we don't see that. That's why people also disenfranchised, even worldwide, in some areas, we're seeing so many coalitions because we went from an era of the Chris Honeys, mm. you know, the Steve Beacles, mm. like leaders who had so much nationalism and pride and were very clear in who they are and what they are. It's not that one minute this person's in this party, mm. a few years he starts his own party. There's a lot of hopping. Yeah. With, without mentioning names, I think we all see it, especially in Gauteng. So, twofold the question is just to get more on insight. One, can your party really be inclusive? Because the constitution is quite broad in how it includes people. I don't want people to mistakenly think mm. you're a Christian party and you're only going to follow Christian views. Mm. And secondly, do we have the leadership to make some of the decisions that your party believes in in terms of capital punishment mm. and ending corruption and unemployment? Yeah, the party is very inclusive. Um, you know, that is why it's... V- I don't think I've ever said the Bible says this, mm. therefore this must happen. Yeah. It's always the case, Okuba, this is what's wrong in the country. Yes. This is a consequence as a result of what's wrong. This is the solution. Even on the question of the death penalty, we take our view based on what transpired in 1995. When the death penalty was abolished, it is the people, um, you know, the, the um, people who wrote about that time said there was a public outcry meaning the people wanted the death penalty, mm. but the powers that be did not want the death penalty because they wanted um, this new liberal constitution. Mm. Or in, in our view, we are saying that the people, their interest, their will needs to sub- supersede the, yes. the will of whoever that is president, whoever that is a member of parliament. So that is why even on the question of the death penalty, because the contentious issue, we said um, to the president, have a referendum so that the people decide, mm. um, so that you don't have elected members that are going to decide on behalf of 62. You're not going to have 400 members or a, an executive, um, which is less than 50 cabinet ministers, deciding on behalf of 62, 62 million, million people. Yes. Then on the question of leadership, maybe let me answer that question in this way, to say it is not about them not having it in them, mm. you know, to be bold, to be patriotic. But it's rather the, the, the capital um, or the system being so clever to an extent whereby it co-ops people, people yeah. so that when you have these people, they are no longer going to have that free will to be patriotic and to be bold. Rather, they're going to be mouthpieces of capital. I want to make an example. Um, you know, a lot of people say all of these guys, mm. Otatu Mandela and the likes, they were in exile. Others, they were in prison. No job, no means of an income. Hardly a few years after they were reintegrated into society, they were living in box bags, in nice houses, you know. And the question is, by Tata Pimad, you yeah. know. <laughs> so you find that capital is so smart, or the system is so smart, because they knew the apartheid is going to collapse. Um, so it, did not, it was not even profitable for for apartheid to continue. So they started negotiations way before. That is mm. why um, Utat Mandela was moved from um, Robben Island to another place whereby he was interacting with some of these people mm. so that, you know, the way, you know, by Sofnish, Abim Lungi, so, so that by the time now the negotiations start, you already have quite a number of them mm. agreeing with your positions. Look at, for example, how many people who took part in Cordesa a billionaires, a millionaires. Mm. So it shows how they were co-opted into the system. So now they are not representatives of the people. Mm. They are now representatives of the system. But in their own parties, they'll purport to be representing a band. So that is why the issue of who funds you as a party and who funds you as a, as a leader, as an individual, is critical because you can have all of the right ideas. But hey, shame. If you're in the pocket yeah. of someone, <laughs> ah, I can see him. Yeah, because <laughs> you, you can come. I just want to say, for me, you're absolutely right because even those parties who talk socialism, yeah, if at a high level the country is driven from a capitalistic view, those the bearing mm. of you coming in is it's 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 fanciful, it's wishful thinking because the Thomas Sankara thing is really correct. Like yeah. if you the piper, you're paying the piper. So even. Yeah. At the, end, at the end of the day, I think it just, unfortunately, it basically speaks to human need and human greed, either mm-hmm. one of the two. If, like you're saying, they came from before the end of apartheid, they had nothing, mm-hmm. so they had a need, which was 
survival. Mm -hmm. And then now there's also the other side of greed. And I think they have been steps ahead of those, the powers that be the elite. Mm -hmm. They know through systems and co-opting. That's why a lot of these political parties are funded by the same people. Yeah. They are just touching on those things. And it's something that we need to move away from mm -hmm. it going forward. Yeah, I mean, out of interest, I'll ask you blank, because you, you're not. Do you believe in capitalism? Capitalism? Yeah. No. You prefer I, socialism? I don't think capitalism could work, especially in a country such as South Africa, whereby there's the highest unemployment rate, highest inequality, and highest poverty. You need to have state intervention or the state playing a dominant role when it comes to building, um, you know, or creating a better life for the people. Capitalism is more driven by the companies, corporates that are concerned about one thing and one thing only, which Pro is profit. the bottom line. Yeah. Whereas a government, Yona, needs to, that is why you know, we believe, Kuba, you know, during the times of COVID, there was a lockdown. Many countries um, whereby you had a government that actually is in power, you had a government that was able to say, people are not working. Therefore, if you are renting as an individual, you are not going to pay rent. Mm. And then said to the banks, these companies or you know, um, landlords are not receiving money from their tenants mm. because of they are, they, are, um, they, are not, um, they are not paying their rents. Therefore, Nina, you are not going to. So it was a systematic way because those governments were actually in power. Whereas when it comes to our country, it is corporates that in power because you don't have a sense that government is able to you know to decisively even hold corporates accountable for some of the things that are happening in our country so so do you then think government can get to a point where they they can attract talent because the problem is i mean as it stands which is which is leading to my next question as it stands it's very difficult for 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 talent and people to go work in government um you know how how can then if if we if we don't if we don't push for capitalism and we're pushing for state how can the state then empower so that we can actually attract talent and then maybe my last question or maybe two questions is whether do you <laughs> do you want to do politics for uh, how long out of interest and then lastly do you enjoy hip hop <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah the first question i think once we've got seven leaders in our country is going to equip and enable and create an environment whereby talent is going to be able to come into the um, public sector. Because we find that public sector has got the opportunities, there's bigger budget because we're dealing with the budget of the state. But what makes it to be difficult for people coming from corporate to survive there, it is corruption, it is patronage, it is whereby you know the talents of the people are stifled because you need to toe a particular line even if it goes against your values. But once you've got people that are presiding over the government, which is servant leaders, then the entire outlook is going to change. And a lot of people think that it is something that is nearly impossible. But I want to make an example. You know when in 1994, look at how South Africa managed to change you know, when it comes to legislation. Mm -hmm. The, you know, the governments, and because you had people that were so eager to bring change, you know, majority of the people in their 30s, oh, Lindy, oh, Lindy, oh, so it shows if you got the right set of leaders, um, South Africa can be um, a better country and we could attract people to, to, to actually work there. Then how long am I going to be in politics? I don't know. The thing is, I did not even plan to, <laughs> to be in politics. I did not even plan to be in politics. You were chosen. Some yeah. leaders are born. Yeah. Some yeah. Are so it's something that came as a divine assignment. So that is why I'm not even attached to this position. I was asked in another uh, platform, Mukuba, um, how long do you want to stay? And I said, look, a, public, a, a position whereby you are serving the people, do mm. not be attached to it, mm. either financially or emotionally, because it's not yours. Should the people decide to go back, thank you, you've done enough, you mm. need to be saying, okay, thank you for the opportunity, you step aside and you give your support to mm. whoever. Mm. The reason why the country, again, is having all of these problems, you find that Abantu, they are staying into these positions, mm. even if um, it is no longer serving the interests of mm. the people. Mm. So if the time comes whereby the powers that be in the party feel I'm no longer serving them, I need to step aside and allow whoever that the party deems they can serve the party well. Mm. To, because if 
I can't be preaching about in the best interest of the party or in the country. And then you're clinging onto a position. Then I'm clinging because it's all about me. Yeah, yeah. Well. So that is why when I got to parliament, I made sure I'm going to study. When I got to parliament, I only had a bachelor's degree. Now I've got master's. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. See, leadership. Up, 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 upskilling, upskilling yourself. Yeah, upski- what, upskill yourself, critical. live within your means so that if Kusitwa, thank you, no longer be a member of parliament, so the salaries, the benefits, you not longer, stress, yeah. how are you going to maintain mm. this um, yeah. lifestyle? Because mm. you find that majority, some members of parliament now end up signing deals with the devil, mm. end up selling out the people because selling they, their souls, basically. Yeah, they need to maintain a particular lifestyle. Um, and um, without that lifestyle, they no longer have relevance. Mm. And then on the hip hop question, I actually <laughs> like old school hip hop. Yeah. Yeah. Classic. Yeah. Oh, yes. So your Dr. Dre's, yeah. your Wu Tang Clans. Oh, yeah. This man's yeah. going uh, places. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, gold, the golden You're going to start another conversation. <laughs> <laughs> We're not even going to go on that fight, but I mean. I, ju- I, I just hope that one day ATM doesn't also recruit because we can see other parties are recruiting from. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know our, our 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 view on this is that people are looking for fresh ideas. Yes, yes. Um, people different, different perspectives. Different perspectives. Yes. People who are eager, not people who are coming with a baggage from party A, party yes. B. Mm. So that is why I think you know when people wrote us off in 2019, mm. say hi, these ones, yeah. um, they don't have experience in politics. But when we got into parliament, we offered a fresh perspective, yes. fresh approach. Yes. That is why other people were saying that ATM has been the most effective opposition party in parliament mm. given what we've raised and the kind of influence that we've had with only two seats. Mm. And we've got parties with bigger seats in our, in our, in our parliament. Mm. But our view is to say, we're not in parliament to just add the numbers or mm. listen to what the, the, majority, the majority is saying, but effectiveness yeah because you know when you when you understand your role as a member of parliament mm. it takes you as an individual to write a letter to a speaker and call for a motion of non-confidence um you know call for a section 89 committee write to the president and highlight um your proposals on how to deal with unemployment load shedding mm-hmm. but if you are going to be going there as a party with one seat and we are just going to w- listen to where the wind is going, then you have betrayed the trust mm. of the people that elected mm. you. Because the people did not elect you to be led by other parties yeah, in parliament. Yeah. They elected you to represent them. And once, if you are confident of your abilities, confident mm. of what you, um, on what you believe is the truth, even if you are one, you are going to stand in parliament and speak your truth. Make a difference. Um, you know, when we spoke about Palapala, Pala, initially people are like, ah, it's, okay, it's a joke. Yeah. But when the voting came, remember that motion in December 22, when the voting came, a part with only two seats yeah. was able to convince, I think, more than 170 members to vote with it, yeah. including members of the ruling party. So that is what we need from um, 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 parties in parliament to represent the people, mm. never mind the noise that will going to come from the media, the mm. NGOs, or the powerful players. Just stay in tune. What do the people want? Because you are there to represent the people. Sure. And I think I think maybe yeah, like I, I think people should stop listening to the media because the media the media is pushing three parties. Like uh, they will push uh, your, your ruling party, DA and EFF. You know they wouldn't push like the ATMs and and other 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 parties. You know well. to come in there. Sorry to yeah, cut you. Yeah, yeah, no, please, please, please. You know yeah. these polls, yeah. these polls that were pushed by the media. Yes, yes, I saw them. Yeah. They put Ecopne <laughs> at I think two percent. Yeah. ATM was not anywhere featuring there. And Cope should be dead. And if you look at the manifesto launch, national manifesto launch of Cope in Hammerskral, less than five hundred people were there. Versus a Johannesburg <laughs> rally ATM, whereby we had over eight thousand people yeah. just from Johannesburg. So in media, remember, in media is owned by the very same owners of the economy. Yeah. So they use the media to to push, to push a certain mm. narrative. Mm. So and you find that there's going to be a person also to oh ATM is not even featuring in this poll, yeah. yeah. meaning yeah. um you know meaning ATM when I'm voting for ATM um. Um, good one, don't, I'm wasting my, my vote. Yes, yeah. yes. Therefore, they are made, they are swayed by the media not to vote for ATM because 
they have not been included on the poll. So most of these polls, I want to assure you, don't mm. take them seriously. Yeah. No, I agree. Because yeah. they are there. No, they're, like, they're I, like straw polls. Yeah, yeah. I, I really agree with you. And, um, you know, it's one of the points that I made. I saw a recent poll, uh, for example, that had, um, you know, the ANC at 39, 36 percent, whatever. Mm. And then um, when I looked at how the poll was done and who, how many people, they spoke to about 1,500 people. Most of them are yeah. here in Joburg. It yeah. was on, a tel- it was telephonic. And I'm just thinking if someone is in the rural area and you're speaking English and you're calling them, mm. you're trying to ask them, they're going to hang up the phone very quickly, for example, yeah. right? Mm. So you, so, so, um, you know, um, and, and that made the front page of certain newspapers, you yeah. know, so showing the exactly the, the the narrative that you are saying and just on that point i know we're almost out of time right but uh my my sort of parting parting question is um you know your overall views in terms of uh where you think how you think the uh, elections are gonna go uh come uh, next month and um what, and what you are hoping for as a party yeah i think people um especially the pollsters, NGOs, media, are going to be so surprised mm. um, by the outcome of the elections. Mm. Because, for example, as we have so much support that people do not even comprehend the amount of support. Mm. Um, I want to make an example. Many parties had their ma- national manifesto launches in um, halls that accommodate 3,000, 4,000. Whereas in a just a Johannesburg rally, a regional rally of Johannesburg, with over 8,000 people that are there. Um, on the 27th, I'm going to take in, which is another regional rally, and the venue that we book is 10,000 seater. Mm. And we're going to the different areas, campaigning, speaking to the people. Mm. And the reason why Abantu are going to be so shocked, it is because 2019, a lot of people did not know ATM. Mm. Because for, for you to be voted for, Point of departure, people must know of your existence. Then secondly, people must know what are you standing for. So if you're to compare ATM from 2019 to now, firstly, people know of the existence of ATM. Mm. And secondly, they've got sight on what we are standing for because they've had five years of observing our politics and our ideas and what we are putting forward as a solution to our country. Um, You know, there is, um, you know, on the question of the economy, a lot of people resonate so much with the question of saying in each and every district there needs to be factories that are producing goods mm. locally. Production um, Because if you are going to, because that is how you are going to industrialize our economy and create jobs. Like you said earlier on, previously in our country, um, where I grew up, there was a factory, Yepep, which is 500 meters from my house. Mm. And majority of the people that were working in that factory we're coming from M. Sobom for the township. Mm. Ipeb, the store in town, was sourcing all of its clothes from this factory. Mm. Now, you find that now, majority of the goods that we have in our country are produced elsewhere. Mm. Um, we've got even, you know, silly things such as toothpicks that are produced in China. Um, we've got candles. You know, one would think that oh. with load shedding, <laughs> you, would, uh, you would have a Something government. as basic as a candle. Yeah, you've got, you would have a government that's, okay, we've got a problem with load shedding, Let's yeah. have a factory of candles, of candles you know, and just at a very basic <laughs> level. At a very basic level, yeah. But so when we speak about these issues, people are like, yeah, you know, we, we agree with you. Again, on the question of SMMEs, when we're adamant to say 50% of government spending legislated, not a case whereby mm. if a certain financial manager or municipal manager or, you know, um, CEO or premier, yeah, or premier feels mm. like it. No, mm. it needs to be legislation mm. to say Mandated. without compromise, all government departments, whether say national government department and provincial. entity, provincial, municipality, 50% of your spending must go towards S- um, S- um, SMMEs. SMMEs. Mm. And then this thing of also saying eight, um, ten, uh, any government contract that is below 10 million needs to be set aside for SMMEs mm. because you can't have a government contract of like a million. You've got a big company like Bidvest wanting to enter and compete mm. with an SMME. It's unfair on the SMME. Yeah. So people resonate with that when it comes to the economy. They also resonate with how we're saying, Kukuba, on the um, you know, food security. We've got so many people that are in poverty. We've got malnutrition in our country. You've got families um, who go to bed without food. You've got people, I read two stories of people, women in the Eastern Cape, who poison their children and themselves because they don't have food. So when we, po- when we put a solution there to say, we have a policy 80, under the ATM government, there's going to be a policy 81, 
household one farm mm. in the sense that um, people are going to be encouraged to farm. They're going to be given the resources to farm because once people are given the resources to farm, they are going to eat what they've um, produced themselves. No one is going to go hungry. Whereas cookie card, mm. elapa, that mm. is going to produce something. And secondly, if we are to observe how a Toyando, a vendor, um, I think also a pushback ridge, you are going to have many vendors lining next to the street selling whatever excess produce they have. Mm. And once they do that, then it makes them to be able to participate in the economy because at a basic level, you farm so that you've got something to eat. Once you produce excess to what you need, mm. you sell it to the people. And also linked to that is saying, Kukuba, we are also of the view, Kukuba, they need to have a government policy, a team, 50% of whatever produce that you get, for example, in the um, retailers Eval, mm. must come from the emerging farmers from Eval. Mm. Because we've got many young black farmers who are producing something, but they can't get shelf space. Because these white companies, what they are very good at, it is to make sure but money, money circulates around them. That is why, for example, you are going to go to um, um, Uchuro, the school, you'll be forced there to say, this is where you buy uniform. Mm. Yeah. This is where you buy some of the things. Mm. And when you try to do some basic research, who is owning Uchuro? Who's owning these companies? You find that there's a link somewhere. Mm. So um, even with the farming, you find that some of these farmers are having ownership or interest in some of these retailers, mm. like ShopRite, or Checkers, etc. Now, when we're saying about 50% of whatever produce they have must come from emerging farmers, then you are creating shelf space, and then you're also creating competition. Competition benefits the con consumers. And when people are saying it will never work, Botswana is a classic case of how excellent it is working because for the very longest time, the produce that was in the shops in Botswana was coming from the farmers in South Africa. Up until, and 100%, up mm. until the, fa um, the government of Botswana said we're going to localize. 50% of whatever produce from our um, retailers must come from the farmers in Botswana. Recently, as um, end of last year, 90% of any food that you find in Botswana That's has right. been produced by the farmers in Botswana. Mm. So that is how the model is working. So for us to transform the economy, get more people to be active in the economy, there needs to be state intervention, and people agree with that. And then on the question of education, people agree with us when we are saying we need to have a skills-based education system, mm. whereby the government or the Department of Education needs to ask our, itself, what are the skills that are needed by the economy? And then the education system is there now to answer those needs in the sense that an education system needs to produce the skills that are required by the economy so that when a person leaves metric, they are basically going to fill the gaps as required by the economy. Um, so that is why I'm saying it needs to be skills-based mm. and it needs to be linked to the needs of the economy so that we're not teaching kids things that are not even relevant to what mm. the economy needs. We're living in the digital world now whereby we need to have more um, students that are inclined to the Check. digital economy. Mm. Again, we need to have an economy or a skills um, education system that is based on the mineral wealth of the country. Because this thing of mineral wealth is very superficial now. Okuba, we've got gold, we've got platinum, we've got chrome. But if you go to our schooling system, is our schooling system actually making it a reality to the students? Okuba, this is our mineral wealth. Whereas in our view, if you are to go to any school, whether it's in the Eastern Cape where there's no mine, the basics of mining, Okuba, in our country, these are the minerals that mm. we have. Mm. And this is how these minerals are processed. These are, this is the value of these minerals. So that when kids are growing up, you don't have a tiny fraction of students who are actually venturing into studying mining mm. at a high institution mm. level. You know, and you have majority of people that are there processing these mines are coming from, uh, pro processing these minerals are coming from other countries. So when it comes to the question of law and order, we're saying that number one, employ more police so that we increase the police presence. so that you have yeah, police presence, yeah. so that you have an increased police visibility yeah. and at the same time you train um, the police adequately. Because last year there were 30,000 uh, murders that were um, recorded. Yeah. Out of the 30,000 murders that were recorded, only 27 
um, of those murders were actually solved and there were actual convictions, which means we have um, over 25,000 cases that are not solved. So we, we can't even talk about the death penalty without addressing, but mm. people must be caught first mm. and there must be overwhelming evidence for them to actually be convicted. And for that to happen, we need very good um, detectives. We need um, policemen that are going to capture mm. the statements, investigate mm. well, not con contaminate the, 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 investigation process. Um, the investigation process of the crime scenes. And then from there, you pay them well so that they are not incentivized to be in the pockets of um, criminals. Because now you've got cases whereby you've got policemen that are in the pockets of criminals. And in our view, those policemen, if you are going to be a policeman and you are found to be corrupt or working mm. with, a, with a criminal, mm. the appropriate sentence must be life sentence without the possibility of parole. Because mm. harsh punishment. Yeah, it, it yeah. needs to be harsh punishment mm. because what we're effectively doing, you are leading South Africa to collapse because people have got faith in you as a policeman mm. because of the authority of the state. And you yes. need to uphold that position that you have. Exactly. Now, if we are figuring as a policeman now, you abuse that authority and you work with the, um, with the, um, with the criminals... Criminal then it means people are no longer going to have faith Indeed. in the entire state. Mm. And it is because of your doing. You know how Singapore did it when it comes to eradicating corruption? They actually arrested politicians, yes. the people that are powerful. Yes. You know? mm. So in our view, politicians, public officials, immigration officers, police, mm. if you are caught there being corrupt, mm. you need to pay the harshest sentences because it's going to send a strong message to society to mm. say, this is not going to be tolerated. The tone yeah. at the top. The tone. Yeah. And I think in closing, we could go on forever, obviously. But, but I think I think Mr. Zungula was finishing off the pillars. He was yes. talking about the yeah. pillars. Yeah, yeah, the, was, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I will give him the, the floor to finish <laughs> off the pillars. But I think we one thing I, am, I mm. do like that's coming from you, encapsulating that look overall, to there, for there to be the change that required throughout the country at the national level, there has to be will and desire at yeah. every level of institution, those who are empowered, those who represent the people, be it in parliament, be it those law of law enforcement, be it government officials, that the basic message is that you are there for the people and not yeah. for, for self-enrichment. So maybe in a quick two minutes for you to sum up, obviously we're giving you the platform, it's been a great interview, but obviously we can't go on forever, but yeah. I just like would like you to sum up as a, a party leader of the ATM in terms of going forward, your position in the upcoming elections? Yeah, I think what we want to stress um, to the citizens that South Africans need to be the masters of their own mm. fate. Mm. We stress this thing that if you look at the nature of our problems, um, South Africans need to put it aside that a single, uh, a one politician is going to solve our problems or a political party is going to solve our problems, or someone coming from another country is going to solve our problems. Our problems will be solved when we come together as a citizens and we say, this is what we want for our country. So that is why we're of the view, Tinokuba, the people, the will of the people needs to supersede the interest or the will mm. of a leader, a party president, or a party, because it's all about the yes. people. That is why we want them to be involved in the affairs of their own governance. And also to stress, Ukuba, people being involved in the affairs of the country does not start and end with voting. Voting is but one of the processes. But people need to follow parliament. When there's a new bill that is being discussed, people need to know, okay, this bill is here. This is how it's going to affect me. This is how I can contribute. For example, there is this digital nomad visa that they are talking about. People need to be aware of such... Um, laws or visas or processes that are being done by the government express their objection or its support, but people need to be generally involved in Discourse. the political processes mm. of our country. Mm. And at the same time, in your respective home, teach patriotism to mm. your children. Yeah. Um, teach them about how they need to inherit the country. Mm. They need to be involved in terms of shaping the direction the country is taking, no matter how gloomy it may be because of we don't have leaders. But mm. at the same time, the solution to our problems is not going to come from anywhere else but, but the very same South Africans. Great. I think uh, that is a... Great place to end. The questions will be would be end, will be never ending. But Ish. look, thank you, Sia. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to put it no, there. No, no, I was gonna. Uh, no, no. Yeah, yeah. No, I just wanted to, um, you know, before you conclude uh, without me, mm. uh, <laughs> 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 I just wanted to, to give a, a, a special shout out to uh, Tommy Ansel, 
uh, my homeboy from Fixburg who planted the idea for us to invite uh, Mr. Zungula mm -hmm. here and uh, obviously to Miss Pinky who's over here for uh, putting in the finishing touches for this to happen. So <laughs> I, I was worried you're not going to mention Pinky. <laughs> <laughs> no, never, never, never. No. Yeah, no, no, so yeah, no. And, and also, obviously, we wish you well. Mm. I, I actually believe that uh, in this episode, um, you definitely have gained a lot of votes. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, because the people we talk to, we yeah. share similar views yeah. to, to, to what, you've, what you've spoken about. And, um, you know, uh, the average professional is definitely tired and would like to see a difference. And I think you're the light uh, that we are looking for, uh, you know, as a country to... To, uh, to also lead us, yeah. That's all I wanted to say. Can, Sorry, I, can I, I also won't. close? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be long. I won't be long. But um, I just wanted to say, Mr. Zungola, I mean, like, I've been monitoring your progress and you've been doing quite well in Parliament. We need uh, more leaders like you. And yeah, please, don't eat curry when you are big as well. <laughs> Keep it as, uh, be consistent and uh, all the best of the uh, elections. Uh, I know you're going to do well. Yeah, I know you're going to do well. No, yeah. that, Mr. Zungula, thank you as coming through as the president of the African Transformation Movement. We really appreciate, obviously, just not you taking our invite, but just sharing your ideas. And I think overall what I got from you, I, li I appreciate the selflessness in terms of your message. Look, I know it's a long journey. I appreciate the fact that you're starting from the right fundamentals, the right base. Obviously, we'll be watching keenly to see that you don't, like yeah. my colleague said, you don't get swallowed up in yeah. the cesspool that is politics because ultimately being a public servant, you're there for the sake of the people. And I like the fact that in closing, you mentioned that, look, no one is going to come and save South Africa. Mm. It's the same ideals that got the majority to come stand up and say we need to end apartheid. It's that same level of Ubuntu and black pride. And it doesn't have to be nationalism. It's more patriotism mm. yeah. that will come through and, you know, start to fix the problems that we're seeing in South Africa. So thank you so much. We'll be monitoring and we wish you the, the best for all your endeavors. This has been episode 22 of the Business Agenda podcast. Thank you to my fellow calls. Thank you to Nico for making this uh, great episode happen. Thank you to Tepo for the visuals that you're going to see. Uh, sound engineer, teaser, <laughs> final underscore T, and Mr. Mojaki. Thank you to everyone. As always, this podcast is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.